Sí, está. And I think we kept him for comedy hour. There's some uh, gems in the, in the talk there, so thank you very much. Uh, it, it is a serious subject matter, but it's important that we do actually remember the value of the joy that has been suppressed as well as everything else. Uh, so now I'm going to introduce uh, Professor David Livermore, who has a presentation for us today uh, to deal with another important topic, which we've heard about more and more so over the past few months, which is variants and the emergence of mutant variants. So uh, without further ado, I'd love to hand over to Professor David Livermore, who's going to take us through his view on uh, the role that uh, variants play. Uh, over to you, Professor David Livermore. Thank you. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, many, many thanks indeed for the warm welcome uh, this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to be on stage again, actually able to see the whites of your eyes rather than looking at a camera and wondering if the technology is going to collapse yet again. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I start to start with this great man, Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, and his adage, always to think about what the terrain looks like from your enemy's point of view, the other side of the hill. And here, your enemy, I don't know why my slides have swapped to a white background instead of a blue one, but never mind, hopefully you can still read them. Well, you can't. You can't read everything there. But I can talk through what you can't read, so don't worry. Um, to, to suck, so a new pathogen starting off, SARS-CoV-2, must develop you or me greenfield sites into virus factories. And as it creates those virus factories, their quality control is not good. As the viral genome is replicated, mistakes arise, typos, copying errors, mutations. And that's the basis of variants. We're particularly concerned with variation affecting this thing, the spike protein. The spike protein is what binds to your cell, specifically to angiotensin converting enzyme, which gives the virus its entree into your respiratory cells. So changes to the spike may alter that uptake. The spike is also the basis of the vaccines. If you're vaccinated, you're tricked into making spike protein to which you then make antibodies. So we're interested in variation of that spike in terms of does it increase the spreadability of the virus and also in terms of whether the variants start to evade vaccines and to evade immunity. Now, here's the trace of what's gone on in the uh, UK since the uh, autumn of last year. And what you see immediately is a succession of three different variants. EU1, which was the predominant one last summer, then the Alpha or Kentish strain, and then latterly the Delta or Indian strain. Each of these has exploited greenfield sites. Those of us who hadn't had previous infection. And each, in turn, has been a bit more efficient. Now, I don't want to get into arguments about whether this one or that one is 20% more spreadable than the other one. But in general, it's a damn sight the easiest explanation of what's gone on, that this is more spreadable than that, and this is more spreadable than that. And as further evidence, you see this pattern of alpha replaces previous strain and delta replaces alpha right across Europe. You're seeing the delta strain take off in Southeast Asian countries, which previously had been rather good at controlling the spread of virus, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and also the fact that Delta is spreading here in the summer, whereas EU1 behaved like a classic respiratory virus in that it diminished last summer. So spreadability is being selected, and that's what you expect for 
a respiratory virus. Evolution favours the virus that infects with the lowest infected dose and converts you into a virus factory that makes the maximum number of virus particles because that increases your odds of infecting somebody else. Um, again, we've lost some of this. I do apologise for how the slides have swapped colour here. My point is that the virus has now run out of greenfield sites. 90% of us are either immunised or we've had exposure to the virus and have got antibodies. So if the virus is going to stay in circulation, it must start exploiting brownfield sites. It must start getting people who've previously been immunised or had prior infection. Now, what are its odds of being able to do that? Will it generate variants that can do that? We've seen Alpha and Delta in their turn have really been infecting greenfield sites, the previously uninfected, the previously unvaccinated. Well, we can learn a bit, I think, from other coronaviruses. That four of them in circulation, they account for something like 10 to 20% of common colds. Uh, one of them, which you can't see, it's dratted number, it's been lost there, is um, NL63, which gives a rather weak immunity, diminishes over 18 months or so. So 18 months on, you're vulnerable to reinfection. The other two there, OC43, 229E, there's essentially two pools of variants. So you get an infection with a variant from one pool, you get an immunity which diminishes, and then you're vulnerable to infection with a variant from the other pool. That diminishes vulnerability to the first pool restored. So these things are on a four or five year cycle. Just as an aside, OC43 here is, is really very interesting. It may well have been the virus of the so-called 1889 to 94 Russian flu. It may not have been flu at all. It was an outbreak or a pandemic that went on unusually long for a flu pandemic. Uh, the cartoons are from it. Note this, 1892, three years in, um, Note this, this is fake news. It tended not to kill children, just as SARS-CoV-2 doesn't. And do note this, arguments about quinine and its derivatives have a very long provenance, as, as this rather dubious young lady is, uh, is indicating. Um, well, hey, we're again with slides that have gone the wrong colour. But my point here is, will SARS-CoV-2 vary to the extent it starts evading prior immunity. And here it's important to understand that the type of variation that we get in coronaviruses through mutation gives what's called antigenic drift. Small progressive sequential changes. And the immunity we have, or the immunity, yes, hurrah, we've got that bit, um, is a defence in depth. Stick with the military analogies. Your immunity, whether from natural infection or from vaccination, is not a thin red line. It is defence in depth. You make antibodies, proteins, you saw an illustration from one of the previous speakers, that bind to the spike protein but also memory cells that enable you to make more antibodies and a selection for essentially the best sort of antibody. And on top of that, T cells are primed. These are cells which can attack virus-infected human cells. It's unlikely, extremely unlikely, that this sort of drift is going to give a total escape from all this. We know that even if you've had one of those other classical coronaviruses, your T cells are primed in such a way that they do at least have some recognition of SARS-CoV-2 
uh, infected cells. There isn't a complete cross immunity, but there is a degree of recognition. So if T cells can recognise uh, uh, cells that have been infected by SARS-CoV-2 based on prior exposure to some other coronavirus, you're hardly going to get escape or total escape from uh, a mutation to SARS-CoV-2. This is completely different from flu. Flu not only shows drift, it also shows shift, by which I mean you, me, a duck more often, or a, 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 a chicken or a, a, a pig, gets infected by two different flu viruses at once, and there is then a shuffling of the cards, that the virus particles that then come out from that infected bird or animal have bits of each of the different flu viruses. And that can give one like this, which really is different and may well completely escape prior immunity. So it seems unlikely that uh, SARS-CoV-2 will evolve in a single step to get a dramatic escape from immunity. It may do that slow, slow diminishing of immunity. We may get pools of variants as with classical coronaviruses. Now, in contrast to, to Professor McCulloch, I am strongly positive on, on vaccines. And let me, let me try to show you why. This is the case count, and this is the death count in the UK. And the trick is, you take the, uh, the death count, and you go 17 days earlier, and you get that 17 really from aligning where the peaks come. This is the 25th of January, that's the 8th of January. So deaths track cases 17 days before. And you then divide the one by the other, and you get a ratio of about 50 to 55 through this period here. Now, I hasten to stress that does not mean that one case in 55 dies, because we know that we've heard this morning there's a myriad of problems in counting both cases and in counting deaths. But it gives you a ratio. Now, as we come into this period here, that ratio breaks down. And as we come now to the present, you're looking at a ratio of about 340 cases to every one death 17 days later. And critically, the breakdown begins with the alpha strain dominant and continues with the delta strain dominant. So two different strains there and the vaccine providing coverage. And you can look at multiple countries, different vaccines that have been used in the West, also the Russian Sputnik vaccine, which have been effective on this basis. I think there's much more debate to be had about Sinovac and the Chinese vaccines, but they're peripheral to our conversation today. Now, there, are, there is one case that's often cited as indicating potential vaccine failure. And that is South Africa, with the AstraZeneca vaccine and the beta variant, which has remained uncommon here, but's presently spooking the government because it accounts for about 5 to 10% in France. And the trial is here, and mercifully you can see the slide, it's a relatively small trial, uh, vaccination with the AstraZeneca product compared with placebo. Um, 700 odd patients in each arm, so that's about 1 20th of the size of a licensing trial. And you can see that infections, cases so-called, went up similarly in the vaccine and placebo arms. However, very underpowered, small numbers of patients, or vaccinees, I should say, and no severe infection in either arm. And most would accept that the vaccines are better at preventing severe infection than, infec uh, than preventing infection as a whole. What it did do was 
to trigger the South African authorities into selling on batches of AstraZeneca vaccine that they'd got and were about to deploy. And I think they're probably kicking themselves now because this beta strain, it's the pink or, or here, comes right down and is replaced by the delta strain, which you've just seen, the AstraZeneca vaccine, extensively used in the UK, is effective against. Now, one of the critical mutations in that beta strain is the um, E484K mutation. I think this is the only time that a bit of biochemical nomenclature became frequent parlance in the Daily Mail. Um, e, but let me translate it into English for you, because it is it's quite important. 484 is a position within that spike protein. And E is glutamate, is a negatively charged amino acid, and K is lysine, is a positively charged amino acid. So effectively, at a key position on the spike protein, a negative charge is flipped to a positive charge. And that does seem to reduce antibody binding. And that was certainly something that's caused fears. But not only is it present in the South African variant, it's also present in the Brazilian or Gamma variant, which was getting some traction in the United States. It's the dominant one in Brazil, as you might gather, but it was getting some traction in the United States. But as vaccination has been deployed in the States through March, through till, till May, June, you can see it shrinks. It really was a storm about nothing. The vaccine hasn't failed, despite this concern about diminished antibody binding. And very likely, that's for exactly the reason I said, that immunity, be it triggered by vaccine or infection, is defence in depth. Ladies and gentlemen, to close, we have to live with this virus. We are not going to eradicate it. We have only managed, and again, forgive me, you can't see the text, we have only managed to eradicate one viral disease, smallpox, caused by a particularly stupid, unchanging virus. Here we have something that's much more complicated. Um, track and trace and such like is not going to work. It hasn't worked so far, and it's presently recording something like 50,000 cases per day. We have, for gonorrhea, a bacterial disease, which I've worked extensively on, 50,000 cases per annum, with contact tracing. And we have not managed to eradicate gonorrhea, and you can remember far better whom you slept with, I hope, than whom you breathe next to on the tube. I, if you feel that doesn't apply to me, tell me. I'm, I, I'll, I'll, I'll be curious to hear. And even a country like Singapore, which has been very successful at keeping SARS-CoV-2 in abeyance, is now swapping to accepting that COVID-19 must be lived with. And note the people here are not the mavericks. These are the establishment for Singapore on the panel. And for any of you who know Singapore, the Straits Times is very much the paper of record. Um, the price of peace is vigilance. Um, the virus, as I say, is going to be with us. I do not believe... The vaccine manufacturers do not believe, Professor Bell does not believe that we are going to get dramatic single-step vaccine or immunity escape from a coronavirus in the way that you can for, with influenza. Nevertheless, that drift, diminishing of immunity over time that we see with other coronaviruses is a reasonable concern. And for that, we do need some surveillance. 
But that does not require the sorts of draconian regulations, the draconian track and trace and pinging of how many hundred thousand or million people per week that we presently have. It requires a night watchman type surveillance, sequencing of coronavirus from hospital admissions, a limited community surveillance, and a potential to tweak, and I know what I'll say here is controversial to some, to tweak vaccines to adapt them to any variant that does seem to be showing any significant ex escape. But I do not think that will be dramatic or swift. It is something that may be required over time. Certainly, time will do one other thing. And this is perhaps why we do not need to vaccinate the young and children. And that is that they get only mild disease from this or no disease at all. And that they will grow up with, with five coronaviruses in circulation instead of four. And it will evolve over time to be just like one more common cold. And I saw one crazy article in the paper yesterday that said that would take centuries. I do not believe that for a minute. Centuries for a virus like this. If, if the hypothesis about the OC43 and the 1889 pandemic is correct, it took five years with no vaccine, with no uh, precautions taken at all. Now, I don't advocate that, but uh, I think it does give a more sensible time scale. And in the interim, all we need is a night watchman type system and the tweaking of vaccines as necessary. Thank you.